Hello and welcome back to Guillotine 18th Century Chemist Theater. Last time we went from names to formulas and today we are going to show you how to go back the other way. It's really not that bad. So, but to start with, let's review what we did last time. <laughs> so let's, let's go over uh, a little bit of naming again. So let's take vanadium 3 chloride. Now again, if you look at this compound, right off the bat you know the charge of vanadium. It's, it's positive 3. So it's cations plus 3. And then chloride, they didn't give you the charge because as a chemist you know the charge. Chloride's a minus 1 charge because as a halogen it's going to want to gain one more electron, which is going to give it a negative 1 charge. And remember, chemists don't like to give you redundant information. So you have uh, V plus 3 and Cl minus. So what do we do with that? Well, if, if we have a plus 3 charged cation, uh, we would need 3 negative 1 charged anions to cancel that out. And so there you go. There's your formula right there. It's going to be VCl3. Extremely straightforward. Now again, crisscross took care of that if you wanted to use crisscross. The 3 would go down to the subscript after the chloride and then the one would go down to the subscript after the vanadium. Totally fine. But this is conceptually what's going on. Remember, uh, crisscross is really nice, but it is a little bit of a gimmick, so you want to make sure that you understand what's going on behind it. Uh, chromic oxide, uh, you'd have to look up the old school classic name for that. That's actually chromium-3 oxide. Again, I don't have to tell you the charge of the oxide or any anion, really, because they're all uh, only one charge based on location on the periodic table. They're all main block elements. Uh, but the, the chromium I do have to look up, and that's a plus 3 charge. And so let's put down a plus 3 chromium there. I'll put down a negative 2 oxide. I'll throw another negative 2 oxide. Now I don't have enough positive charge, so let's throw down another one of those. Now i got too much of that, and, and you keep going until it all works out. So it, it's very straightforward. Again, crisscross would have taken care of this. You would have ended up with a 3 in, after the O, and then a 2 after the chromium. But um, again, it's, it's really up to you, whichever way you do it. Um, as long as you understand what's going on uh, behind the scenes. And so today we'll go back the other way. We'll, we'll take a formula and get a name from it. And it's really not that hard. And so, and as, as I like to say, this can be really easy or just easy. And it's really easy if you don't have multiple charge cations. Because if you don't have a multiple charge cation, then you just read what you have. It's, it's extremely straightforward. Because again, remember that just telling a chemist what cations and anions you have in a compound is enough. Because they can figure out the rest. So when you see this compound, when you see aluminum and oxygen as single charge ions, well then you can just say aluminum oxide. A chemist will know aluminum's plus three and oxide's minus two, and they can figure out what the subscripts are. So that's easy. Um, where you get difficult is where you get your multiple charge cations. And so this is where it's to your advantage, and I'm not a huge memorization fan, but this is where it's to your advantage to uh, have memorized your multiple charge cations because you want to be able to identify them and know if you have to name their compounds differently. Now you just can't reverse crisscross all the time because you might have reduced your charge, as Answer Dog says. And so you have to be careful about that. It's just bringing numbers back up uh, and reversing it. That's where crisscross can get you into trouble. But it's, it's a pretty simple uh, way of taking care of that. And remember, we don't have to do this for single charge cations because there's only one charge, just like the Highlander said. <laughs> Um, so you can go ahead and figure out what the charge is on the cation, but it's going to be exactly what the periodic table predicted. So if it is a multiple charge cation, though, let's, let's figure out how we do this. And of course, with a little bit of, uh, you know, who's on first humor here, uh, up over down is a technique. Now again, you don't have to use up over down. Uh, you can visually do this. You can just kind of understand this. You can reverse crisscross with a lot of uh, afterthought about it. but um, this, word, this method is a nice way to start. And so what I say up, I say, okay, well, let, let, let's, let's look at the negative charge. You always know the negative charge. And so if I have two negative two charges, that's going to end up being negative four. So that's what I call up. And then over would mean, well, a negative four would have to be balanced out by a positive four, so that's over. And then down is to distribute it. So you have to distribute that plus four charge among your cations. Now in this case there's only one, so the manganese would have to get the entire plus four charge. But if there's two manganeses, they'd each have a two charge. If there was four, they'd each have a negative one charge. And so that's the basic idea behind up over down. You kind of figure out your meta negative charge, uh, balance it out with a meta positive charge, and then distribute it. Um, again, that seems a little confusing, but it's really not that bad. Let's, let's take a look at it visually. And I, and I know you've seen this compound a lot already, but remember, if this is all the information you have, 
uh, you know that oxides have negative two charge, and I've got two of them. So right off the bat, you know your total negative charge. And so I know my positive charge has to be four. And since there's only one cation there, it supplies the whole charge. So that's it, that's how simple it is. Um, so let's take a look at some examples now. I will uh, wait for you, go ahead, take pause the video and work through these, and then let's chat. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> It's always weird if you didn't pause. But um, all right, so uh, PBO, uh, PBJ, PBO. Well, we know oxide has a negative two charge, and so uh, that PB lead has to have a plus two charge. So that's very simple, lead two oxide. And notice I'm gonna use the stock names. Uh, you wanna know the classic names and how to interpret those, uh, but you know, you, when you're naming them, go ahead and name them stock, unless your teacher tells you they want you to use the classics. And so if, if I had two oxides, then that's a negative four, so I have to balance it out with a plus four, lead four oxide. Uh, if nitrides have a negative three charge, so two negative threes is gonna be, are gonna be balanced out by three positive twos. Iron two nitride. Uh, nitride still has a negative three charge, so if there's only one iron, then it's gonna be iron three nitride. Uh, calcium chloride is super easy. Uh, it's an alkaline, alkaline earth metal and a halogen, so I don't have to look up any charges. Same with lithium, it's an alkali metal and a, and a halogen. So that's super easy. Don't forget to spell fluoride the right way though. But then we have two tin compounds. I have tin two and tin four, uh, because I will need a two charge to balance out two chlorides, and I will need a four charge to, measure, to balance out four chlorides. So I, I went through those pretty fast, but you, you know, take your time and go through those and make sure you understand how we got those. If you need to visually draw them out, visually draw them out. Uh, wh whatever technique works for you, as long as we're getting it correct, that's, that's all we care about. I mean, really the take home point is to remember that um, names and ionic compounds reflect the charge of cations, uh, nothing else. So don't, don't ever think that the number they give you in an ionic compound represents the subscript, because it doesn't. And so we're, we're just getting started here. What we're going to do next is talk about polyatomics. Polyatomics are, are very important because polyatomics are going to let you name more complex compounds, but it's also going to be the gateway to naming acids. Um, and if, if I had to uh, bet what kind of compound a first-year chemistry student is going to name wrong, it would be an acid. And so we'll get to all that in the next couple lessons. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching this, and have a great day.